Over the years, I've done a lot of videos on fakes and copies in the Asian art market and topic talked about the problem of reproductions. And it is not only a problem, but it's a problem that's actually getting worse as time goes on. Hard to believe. And there's certain things that, that new collectors, and what by new, I mean people who have been interested in the subject for less than 10 years. They get into trouble because they become fascinated by the subject, and they also become fascinated a little bit by the financial aspect of it. Um, that is not something that can be overlooked. So they're interested in the, in the art, they, they enjoy seeing it, and they also are thinking in the back of their mind, oh, I might be able to make a little money on this thing. And the simple truth is, is that the rarer an object is, the more likely it is to be copied. All right, you always have to keep that at the forefront of your mind whenever you're looking in the market uh, on, on live auction sites or going out to antique shops or whatever. The rarer the object, the more likely is the piece you're seeing is a copy. And if it's something that's supposed to be supposedly worth, you know, 50, 100,000, half a million, a million dollars in the right market. In other words, if it was authentic and it was being offered in London or Paris or, or Hong Kong or New York or something, it would bring a huge amount of money. Why is it for sale here for uh, uh, five hundred dollars or five thousand dollars or something like that? And the, the the assumption is that many take is that oh the 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 seller made a mistake or the the famous line the auctioneer doesn't know what he has. And I was an auctioneer for twenty years, and I can tell you that that doesn't happen very often. Uh, very rarely, actually, if the auctioneer is paying attention and doing their work. Um, there are basic questions that a collector has to ask themselves from day one whenever looking at an object before they get into trouble and shell out significant amounts of money to buy something only to learn later that they've been taken for, for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And it's and that's a tough pill to swallow and a lot of people have swallowed it. And a lot of people have big collections right now that are going to be swallowing it when they find out that for the last five years they've bought up um, huge numbers of fakes. And it happens all the time, and there are people out there that, that have huge collections of fakes, and they refuse to admit they're fakes because they, they can't bear the thought of being wrong. There, there are people who sell things on eBay all the time. They put, well, they don't sell them that often, but they put them up with huge estimates with these long, long, long explanations of what the piece is, and the piece is a fake. And they are true believers. They really believe what they're doing. There's a there's a there's one particular fellow and I'm not going to name him or anything, but he does YouTube videos about sung wares and rue wares that he claims he's bought that uh, uh, are, are absolutely the best in the world. And uh, if you know anything about Chinese rue wares, you know that a good piece of rue wares is worth in the tens of millions of dollars. And he's got dozens of these pieces and that he can't get them into the market because there's a conspiracy against him, this kind of thing. And, and, it's, and that sort of that sort of uh, uh, thinking uh, buries people alive. All right, you need to know the quality of an object before you uh, buy it, and you need to know the quality in the context of the period that it was supposedly from. Not the quality that it's well, it's well done and it's pretty and it's got nice colors and it does this, it does that. Is does it align with the materials and workmanship of the period? Is it appropriately done? And what are you basing your decision on? And if you're basing it on a photograph off the internet, the chances are the internet image you're looking at is also a fake, unless you're looking at something that sold through one of the big auction houses. And are you able to accurately compare them? Can you tell the difference side by side comparisons? Um, at a glance of a rare piece of porcelain that's authentic that's sold for a huge amount of money versus a very, very good copy. Can you tell? And if you can't tell very quickly, um, then, then you're going to get yourself into trouble eventually. All right. You have to think about quantity. Well, it's rare because there aren't many of them around. It's rare that a thing is worth a half a million or a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or even fifty thousand dollars because it's fairly rare. They didn't make a lot of them. And the chances of it turning up somewhere at a bargain basement price is pretty close to zero. So you need to know that. You need to know how to figure determine the age. And if you can, you want to get some history on the piece and so on and so forth and do, and do all these things. And then you can eventually get into identifying and valuing. And of course, the safest thing in the world is to deal with, with a dealer that knows what he's doing. 
that's been around for a long time and has a well-established reputation in the business as an expert. Not somebody that just has a store set up somewhere, but, but somebody that is known to handle great things, that worked at one of the major auction houses, that worked with one of the top, you know, that, that worked at one of the major dealers in the world, and, and they know their stuff. And when it comes to auctions, there's an awful lot of misunderstandings out there by, by people new to the auction world uh, that they don't understand. For example, they, they, in most states require auction licenses. However, a lot of states don't require auction licenses. You want to be an auctioneer? Just put a sign out. You're an auctioneer. And uh, some, of the, some of the places that don't require auction licenses might surprise you. The state of New York does not require you to have an auction license. Unless you're in New York City, then you have to have one, for example. In most states that do require auction licenses, once they issue the license, they do very little checking ever again on the, on the auctioneer, and uh, uh, they, they're pretty much left to their own devices. Uh, and the ma most important things to the states when it comes to auction licenses is not that you're honest and selling authentic things. They really don't care. I've talked to licensing boards. Um, what they really care about is how you manage the money of your consigner. When you sell the object, where does the money go? Is it set aside properly? Because that's something that could rattle uh, the uh, security of the auction market, uh, uh, you know, the, the integrity of the market as far as that goes. And I've known of auctioneers. There was an auctioneer, a couple of auctioneers up in Maine over the years that got into trouble spending the consigner's money. That's a big problem. They lost their licenses. Uh, there was an auctioneer on Cape Cod years ago that got into trouble. He lost his license, had to move to Florida. Um, and these kind of things happen. But it's only for mismanagement of the, of the funds. It's only mismanagement of the business side with, 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 with you know, property that they, they are selling. It has nothing to do with the authentication of the objects themselves. Rarely do they get involved with that. And uh, that's a big problem. The other assumption is that auctioneers are, are, are probably experts. People think, well, they're auctioneers. They must know about antiques. This is a fallacy. Um, or that they, they have people that they can look to. They'll, they'll call up some experts and bring them in, authenticate the stuff. Most of the time, the experts they bring in don't know much more than they do, if they have anybody to call at all. The simple truth of the matter is, is that very few auction houses in America um, have uh, anybody in-house that truly know anything about Asian art beyond the very, very basics. Uh, they know a bit about Chinese export porcelain. Um, they know a little bit about Chinese robes. Um, they know a tiny bit about jade, and the rest of it is uh, who knows. So, ex you know, they know China trade wares to, 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 to some degree in many places. But domestic Chinese art, domestic Chinese bronzes, porcelains, jades, all that, it's, they, they don't know anything. In, in the entire U.S. right now, give you some idea, like Massachusetts has, uh, I think right now, uh, I'm a licensed auctioneer in Massachusetts, I think right now in Massachusetts, we have about 2,500 licensed auctioneers, something like that, or 3,000. Very few of them are active, but they keep their licenses. I still have my license, so I haven't done an auction in a few years. But across the country, there are tens of thousands of auctioneer licenses out there. And among those tens of thousands of auctioneers that are out there, um, less than, in my opinion, and less than, less than nine or ten auction houses in the entire United States have anybody on staff that knows anything um, of any depth about Chinese art. And uh, you can sort of name them off the top of your head, of course. The major auction houses, uh, uh, Bonhams, Sotheby's, Christie's, Doyle's, Freeman's, um, uh, 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 Heinemann to some degree uh, is pretty good. Um, uh, that's about it. Uh, Skinner in Boston, um, not really. Um, they, they, they get good things from time to time, but they are always mis, misidentifying and misdating things, and they're not sure, and they include a lot of fakes in their sales. Um, um, it's gotten a little better in recent years, but they used to include mountains and mountains of copies, um, and they would just not date them. they just throw them in there and, and hope for the best. Uh, and that that was a problem. So, and the and the reason is that most of the auction houses are not willing to pay what what an Asian art expert would want. You can hire somebody that knows about American furniture for nothing. You can hire somebody that knows jewelry for very little. You can hire somebody that knows about uh, you know f people with fine arts degrees are a dime a dozen. Uh, but Asian art, the whole other breed of cat. It's a whole other category. And as a result, most auction houses don't bring somebody in. The other fact of the matter is, is that there's not enough legitimate stuff around in this category for the auction houses to hire an in-house expert.
That's the simple truth of it. Even though you go online and you see dozens of sales every day um, that are available on, on the different platforms, uh, all claiming to have an amazingly important uh, uh, historic uh, collections that had belonged to Chinese generals and uh, expats from uh, mainland China who fled when Mao came in and they took their collection to Taiwan with them and all these nonsensical uh, stories. Uh, did things get taken out of China when Mao came in? Yeah, a few things. Not much. Uh, the, the, the amount of stuff that people claim was taken out of China um, uh, relative to how, many, how much was actually taken, it's, it's, it's light years, there's, there's, it's, it's miles and miles and miles apart. There were a few people that got things out. They're very well known. They're in parts of very important collections today. Uh, people know who they are. Okay, it's not a big surprise, but today you see uh, on a regular basis there'll be auctions run with you know claiming that this piece, these pieces, all these great paintings by Chi Bai Shi and all these great things, all belong to this general, or all belong to this formal provincial governor of some type, or descended down through the family of a friend of the emperor's dowager. All these, they're all bull. They make them up. They come up with. They even have photographs of these people because the photos are real. And what happens is people see them, they look up the person, he's, oh, he was famous, he's a real guy, <clears throat> this must be his art collection. Not true. Um, we've seen photographs used in auctions where they, they scour the internet and they pull f photographs of beautiful interiors of historic houses and they'll, they'll throw them into Photoshop and edit it and add pieces from their auction into those photos. They edit them in there and they say, oh, here's the house. This is the old house that it was in in New York or the old house that was in Washington or whatever. And uh, here are the objects. They're right there. This photo was taken in 1935. Therefore, these must be legit. The truth is no. No, it's all made up. It's all made up, and it, it's 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 just part of the scam, all right. And I'm not trying to scare everybody away from ever going to auctions, but you have to use a little common sense. That if, if you go to an auction and there's 300 lots, and all of them are supposedly of incredible you know imperial value, you have to say to yourself, what's the likelihood that they would end up here instead of being sold on a on a global stage? by a major firm with, with great bona fides and credentials that can get the piece out and, um, uh, and buyers will believe them. They can't, all right? That's the thing. The local auctioneer can't do that when it comes to Asian art unless he happens to have somebody consulting for him who's a major player, somebody that is known, all right? And that's it. And, and then you have people that want to believe, okay? You, 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 you are people that, that will say, well, I know I'm new to this, but I know this is okay because, because I've done my research or something. And those are the famous last words before the check gets written that's no good, um, for a no good object, rather, all right? And um, you, the, the reality is, is that the chances of a neophyte collector, meaning less than 10 years, or certainly less than five. Can, they say things like, I can, I can find things on the market that everybody missed. And I hear this a lot. I hear this a lot. And the simple truth of the matter is the market is incredibly efficient. And there are thousands of eyeballs scouring the net 24-7 from all over the world looking for the same thing you are. And they know what they're looking at. They really know what they're looking at. All right. Um, um, you, you don't see things that turn up in auctions in Georgia in some fake auction then being resold, um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, six months later at, uh, you know, Christie's or Sotheby's or, or, or at Poly auctions in Beijing. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. They disappear. The people that buy them get stuck with them. They find out later that they bought a fake and they just quietly put away and uh, um, eat it basically is what happens. They just eat it and they, they don't go back and try to go after the auctioneer. And um, uh, it, it just, it, 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 you, you, the simple truth is you can't build a great collection without advice from somebody who has decades of experience. And when you look at the auctions that, that turn up that have huge collections in them, uh, we've seen them in recent years, the Irving collection, for example. When you go through his collection, you find that he bought almost nothing at auction. He bought it all from major dealers. He bought it all from highly regarded dealers because he was a very smart guy. He knows what he's doing. Um, there are many, many great collectors out there. They have their own curatorial staffs of, of, of you know, two, three, four, five, six people. And then they have people sort of on retainer who are experts around the world that they can reach out to on a moment's notice and have them check something for them. And those who you're competing against when you, when you, when you think you found that Imperial Chin Lung Moon Flask, 
or you think you found that uh, you know Chenhua uh, Palace Bowl. Um, you're competing against these guys, and uh, if they're not stepping up to bat, uh, it's it's a fake. And they've seen it. I guarantee you, they've seen it. All right, these piece, pieces, I have pieces sent to me all the time um, through the inquiry program, through the identification assistant thing, things that I've seen. And um, I sometimes get the same pictures, the same objects sent to me very often um, by five or ten people saying, you know, I, I found this in an auction. Is this legit? And um, sometimes um, the piece is okay. It's worth a few thousand bucks. And the, most of the time, though, it's just a really, really, really great fake. And really great fa fakes do exist. Uh, uh, the, 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 the people that work in the world of reproductions in China, the porcelain makers, the bronze makers, the cloisonne makers, especially those cloisonne makers, uh, the jade carvers, um, well, the porcelain makers are pretty great too. Um, these guys have fantastic amounts of experience. Many of them work in multi-generational family businesses. They have access to all the best material. They've owned and handled and gone to see and studied the greatest rarities in, in the Chinese porcelain and Chinese art world, Chinese bronzes. They know what to look for. They know the stuff. They really do. They know more about it probably than the heads of most departments at the uh, major auction houses. All right? They certainly know as much. And this is something that uh, nobody likes to admit, but that is the, that's like one of the dirty little secrets, is that the fakers and forgers know enormous amounts. These are not am these are not hack amateurs that are out there just you know in, in some, some, some weird little place trying to make copies. These are people who are slick, they have painting skills, they've been trained in classical Chinese painting, they've been trained in chemistry, they know about firing techniques, they know what foot rims should look like, they know what the glazes should look like, and they do an absolutely amazing job at replicating them in some cases. All right, It's just that simple. So the chances of you going to an auction house in South Dakota and buying something that's worth a huge amount of money and then flipping it in New York or Hong Kong and cashing in on it is extremely remote. Uh, unless you're a very, very experienced uh, uh, dealer or collector. I mean, really, really, ex really experienced. All right. Um, and then sometimes I, I, you, you hear about people that, that will, will see an auction and they'll say, yeah, I know everything in the auction is a fake, but that one piece got by them. That one piece is okay. Uh, I know of one case where that happened in the last five years, <clears throat> where an auction house that is known to sell fakes, um, huge amounts of fakes, um, actually put in uh, uh, and sold for very little money an extremely rare piece of uh, Jai Jing uh, porcelain. And it was apparently consigned by somebody who heard they were having an auction. He just gave it to them. It was just a complete fluke. And uh, I talked to the man that bought it. And uh, it's going to be in a major auction house. But that's once. And the, the truth is that the auctioneer that sold it had, and, and this was an Asian auction house, they had no idea what it was. They just didn't know. And so the idea that you're going to find something that everyone else misses is, is highly improbable. All right. Uh, uh, the, the simple truth is that most auction houses know nothing about Asian art other than a bit about Chinese export wares, a little bit about Canton, Fitzhugh, Nanking, Rose Medallion, Rose Mandarin, uh, Rose Canton, uh, a little bit about Chinese robes, uh, a few basics about bronzes, and that's it. And often they can't tell the difference between a Chinese bronze and a Japanese bronze. Um, um, it's a very common thing. Nor can they tell the difference between Japanese, some Japanese blue and white, and some Chinese blue and white. They don't know. And I, I, you know, seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases of Japanese blue and white being sold as Chinese because it has a Chenhua mark on it. And as we know, um, that that was a common practice in Japan. They put Chenhua marks on blue and white porcelain that they made, even though it's a Chinese mark. All right. And as I said before. The, the, the states where these auctions take place um, that do all this misrepresentation don't really care. And uh, if it's an online only auction, they don't even have any authority because there's no, there's, there's no legal, legally they have no authority because there's nobody physically present in the room. <clears throat> so what happens is, is if somebody buys something, it's a fake, they get stuck with it, they pay for it, now what are you gonna do? You got taken for ten or fifteen thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars, you're gonna have to fight with the credit card company to get your money back when you find out that it's a fake. And if you don't do that within thirty or sixty days, you don't even have a slight chance of getting your money back. And if you decide to go after the seller, the auction house uh, uh, legally, uh, your legal bills are gonna be about what you lost. So what's the point? And you may not win on top of it. 
And the auction houses, some of these auction houses rely on this reality. They rely that no one is going to take action against them. You're not going to do anything about it. You might write them a nasty letter. They'll throw that in the trash because they don't really care. All right. But they just rely on the fact that if you get taken by them and you realize you've been taken, you're not going to do anything about it. All right. And that's just that's just uh, 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 that simple. And people who have great Asian art collections do not consign them to uh, mediocre uh, uh, auction firms with no experts because they, they 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 own this collection. If they've collected it, like many of the auction houses claim, um, it's obvious that anybody that collected these things, if they're authentic, is going to send them to the best market there is. And the best market there is are with the major auction houses around the world or with a prominent dealer who can um, sell them on a commission basis and also do very well for you. It's a, it's a, it's a method that's often overlooked. Uh, 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 we talk often about high prices achieved at auction. Walk into some major dealers and see what they're asking for stuff. And um, um, often they're selling it for much more than the auction prices. Auction prices are not the top of the market. A piece that can sell at an auction for $500,000 can easily be resold later for, um, uh, by some dealers for over a million. So some, some collectors prefer to sell through dealers. They'll, they'll, they'll have them take it and the dealer will take 40 or so percent of the, tr of the deal. But the amount they're getting is so much more, it's, a be it's better for the seller. And they like, that they like having the control of it. All right, but the thing is, is that, is that nobody with a major collection is going to consign anything to some rural unknown auction house uh, 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 and allow bargain basement uh, estimates to be placed on them, because uh, as the rule book says, the reserve, the minimum selling price, can't be any higher than the low estimate. So if you have something that you know is worth five hundred thousand dollars, you're not going to give it to an auction house with a three to five thousand dollar estimate because the reserve it can't be any higher than three thousand dollars. And very, 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 very few to no collectors or no dealers selling are going to be willing to risk that kind of exposure, especially in an auction house that nobody's ever heard of, all right, and that, or an auction house that people have heard of and has a bad reputation. All right. And the next thing to think about is this, is that auctioneers, um, regardless of where they are in the world, all have access to the Internet. They have all have access to the same Google images that you do. They all have access to the to the museums that are online. They have auction access to uh, the major auction houses and so forth. All right. So it's 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 not like you can go on the Internet and find something that they can't find. Chances are they can find it and they can probably find it better than you if they want to. All right, and this is this is just part of the uh, p part of the process that you have to learn that that rare things sell in rarefied markets. All right, and um, if you have this idea in your head that you can't sell what you have because nobody knows who you are, and that it's a protected market, like like I talked about, uh, you know, some people claim there's this, a lot of people say that well, there's you know that cabal that prevents great things from getting the market, and it's just uh, you know it's just for a certain group of people. That's a total lie. It doesn't exist, um, and um, you know when the day comes that you get something great. You'll be able to get it into a, into a great auction if you decide to sell it, or a major dealer will be more than happy to write you a big fat check for it. And sometimes you can make more money by selling to a dealer. Um, if you know what you're doing, and you know pretty good negotiating skills, and he's, he's, a, he's a good dealer, um, and he has a customer for it, he may pay you a very handsome price or a premium to keep it from going to an auction. And that's, that's, that kind of thing actually happens. Um, so you, 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 you don't want to write them off as a, a, a not a legitimate option uh, for yourself. But uh, you, just, you just have to be extremely careful at all times. Um, and especially uh, by you, you, people get trapped into the anecdotes. Uh, they'll, they'll say, well, this guy in Long Island found a bowl. He paid $2, mil paid two dollars for it and it sold at Sotheby's for $2 million. And that kind of incident that does happen once in a while not saying it doesn't, but out of the millions and millions and millions of transactions that happen every year with the, with the purchase and sale of, of, of objects at yard sales and even just in the Chinese and Asian art category, it's an extremely rare occurrence. Uh, it's extremely rare. And in that case, the, the, yeah, the guy and his wife were at a yard sale. They bought this pretty little white bowl. They brought it home. I guess they put their keys in it. They put M&Ms in it from time to time, all this stuff. And then they brought it to some sort of an appraisal day that I guess it was Sotheby's was running. 
in Long Island as a fundraiser for some local organization. And they came in with the bowl just to have something to bring. And the person there said, holy mackerel, look at this. And yeah, it brought $2 million. So it, so it happens? Yeah, it happens. But it's about the same as hitting the, the Powerball lottery. You know, it's a one in 400 million chance. And uh, that one in, 4 million hundred, one in 400 million chance has cost people small fortunes, thinking that they can do that, that they can find that piece. And if it were that easy, everybody would be doing it. Everybody would do it. The, 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 it's, it's just the reality of it. Uh, uh, the, the truth is, is that very rarely are highly important um, and valuable works of art discovered by non-professionals, all right? Not that it doesn't happen, but it's not likely to happen. And it's not likely to happen if you found it easily, because if you found it easily, everybody's finding it easily. Um, and the, 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 it just, the simple fact is that it takes years and years of experience to seek out know where to look and how to track down and hunt out pieces <clears throat> and i can tell you in personal experience i've lost track of I, we talk about sometimes the things that we have found in auctions that's all true but I, I could give you a much longer list of the number of times i've gone to auctions that had good looking ads things that look promising and you get there six hour drive and you preview and you're out the door and on your way home in under 20 minutes and you realize that the whole thing was just a waste of a trip. It was just a waste of a trip. So you always have to ask yourself when you're seeing great auction listings, does it make sense? Be honest with yourself. Say, does it make sense that these things are being sold here when if I had them and I don't know anything, I'd be selling them in New York. I'd be selling them in London. I wouldn't be selling them at Charlotte's Auction House in Florida or Eden Galleries in Georgia or Empire Auction House in Boston, which is uh, as bad as any of them. Um, you just wouldn't do it. You just wouldn't do it. And you know why you wouldn't do it, and you're new at it. So think about what a person would do if they had an old collection, and it's been in a family for a long, 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 long time, and they know what the values are. They know when the thing was bought. They're going to bring in the pros. All right? And that's, that's all there is to it. All right, so I'm just saying all this is, is just sort of a, a, a little bit of a guidepost. Set some guide rails for yourself when you're in the market looking around. Uh, don't become overly confident in what you think you know. Uh, uh, don't become overly confident that you think that some auctioneer, because he has an auction license, is, is, a, is, above, you know, is, is above it. He's completely a person of integrity. There are some very good auction houses in America. There are some great auction houses. And um, we talk about them from time to time. There's some good auctioneers who are honest. They tell you what they know. Um, Bronx in North Carolina is one of them. Bronx is a wonderful auction house. It's ethical. They have a good reputation. And they don't claim to know everything about everything, but they're willing to help their consigners. It's a classic case. And uh, uh, up, up around New England for many years, we had Northeast auctions running, run by Ronald Bourgeau, uh, a, a, a guy of amazing integrity, uh, a man of character. And if he didn't know something, he he was willing to get people out there to look at things and identify things. And he stood by his he stood by his his, his offerings. But those auction houses are, are sort of few and far between at times, and you have to keep them always in mind, um, and, uh, that 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 idea in mind. And um, when you do that, then you're on safer ground. But but you know if you encounter an extreme rarity. In, in some unlikely place, your alarm bell should go off a lot sooner than your desire to write a check. And um, once a lot of questions are satisfied, then you can make your decision. But you have to make that decision based on uh, logic and accurate information. And I can't emphasize that enough. And uh, that's all I have to say on the subject. Have a wonderful rest of your week. And uh, we'll be back later with some more videos. Okay. Not today, but tomorrow and Friday and so forth. Okay. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.